we have an exciting discussion ahead of us on digital currency, distributed ledger technology, and cross-border payments. And a fantastic panel here to talk to us about uh, this, this interesting and, and wide-ranging set of topics. Um, I'll read through everybody's bios, and then we'll have short remarks by each of the panelists before we do some discussion on the panel and then open it up for Q&A. Uh, so immediately here to my right is Dr. Ndungu, who is the Executive Director of the African Economic Research Consortium, a pan-African premier, ca premier capacity building network. He's an Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Nairobi, Kenya and is the immediate former governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, where he served two four-year terms as required by law from 2007 to 2015. He has been a member of the Global Advisory Council of the World Economic Forum and a visiting fellow of practice at Oxford University. Prior to his appointment as governor, he was the director of training at the African Economic Research Consortium. He also worked at the International Development Research Center of Canada as a regional program specialist for Eastern and Southern Africa Regional Office in 2001 and the Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis in 1999 as a principal economist. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. Immediately to, to his left is Governor Ingves uh, from Riggs Bank, where he is the chairman of the executive board. He's also a member of the board of directors of BIS and chairman of BIS Banking and Risk Management Committee. He's a member of the general board of the European Systemic Risk Board, member of the general council, <clears throat> excuse me, of the ECB and governor for Sweden in the IMF and board member of the Nordic Baltic Macro Prudential Forum. In 2018, Mr. Ingves was appointed chairman of the Toronto Center for Global Leadership in Financial Supervision. He was previously the chairman of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, director of the Monetary and Financial Systems Department at the IMF, deputy governor of the Riggs Bank, and general director of the Swedish Bank Support Authority. Prior to that, he was undersecretary and head of the Finance Markets Department at the Ministry of Finance, and he holds a PhD in economics. And last but not least, we have Abdel Banda, who is the founder and CEO of Banyan Infrastructure. Founded in 2017, Banyan Infrastructure utilizes machine learning algorithms and distributed ledger technology to encode natural language financial contracts into smart contracts to provide lenders with an integrated SaaS solution for autonomous tracking and reporting of contractual requirements contained in credit agreements used to finance distributed infrastructure systems and transportation assets. As CEO, he's responsible for the company's strategic corporate and market development. Mr. Banda also serves as Director of Africa for Edison Schwest Offshore, the leading U.S. shipbuilder and marine contractor to uh, the offshore energy industry. At Schwest, he supports the company's strategic finance initiatives and previously led the company's corporate and business development efforts in Africa. Prior to coming to Schwest, he was an analyst at Sandler O'Neill & Partners, an investment banking firm in New York. He's also the co-founder and trustee of Students Bridging the Information Gap, a 501c3 in the U.S. celebrating its 10th anniversary building computer labs and libraries for Ghanaian orphanages and schools. He holds a BA in finance from the University of Notre Dame, where, dare I mention here, he also played football. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no fights, no fights. This is a peaceful conference. Um, as I said, we're going to have everyone start with some opening remarks. Dr. Ndungu is going to lead us off. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you can so please. Good afternoon. I'm not so sure when you speak after lunch, I don't know how to uh, make sure that everybody is going to be engaged. But let me say that I'm very happy to be here. And, um, and I think I've shared so many emails with Christy and, uh, and Michael. And so I think I like the team, They're very, very efficient. And so I'm very happy to be uh, here. It's my first time to be in Detroit and the University of Michigan. So I'm very happy that I was able to be invited here. I was told to talk about digital uh, evolution, especially I wanted to talk about e-money and the electronic payments ecosystem. And I wanted to give the Kenyan example. But it's because this is the fourth year I am, I've been away from the central bank, and it looks like everything is following me up. If you look at the, my latest papers, actually, 
most of the papers are focusing on that because everybody has been asking me right on this. My latest paper was to talk about state and uh, uh, it was to talk about digital technology and state and institutional capacity in uh, the global uh, center for global development. It's because this subject matter is actually coming at a time when everybody is excited about the innovations that are taking place. And I think maybe once I share the Kenyan experience, you'll see how actually even the way we look at it in terms of, I know there is always this confusion about uh, cryptocurrencies and, uh, and also the, the domestic currencies. And I always tell, tell people that let's, let's not go there. There's a boundary. If domestic, for example, in Africa, if a domestic currency slides to the dollar or even to the euro by 10%, there will be a commission of inquiry. And I've went through so many of those. Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry, why did the exchange rate slide? It changes massive price structure, mass, massive relative price structures. But we have seen Bitcoin just crash, and then there's no commission. I don't know who can provide the Commission of Inquiry. But anyway, we will debate about that. <laughs> then um, before I go into the subject matter, I'm. You know, when you change your jobs, you also have to remember, actually, to pay some form of uh, marketing. And this is where, this is AERC, African Economic Research Consortium. It's a, collaborative net, a, collaborate, uh, a collaborating network. We've been there building capacity in Africa for the last 31 years now. And we build capacity through research and graduate training, collaborating with our public universities in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And we also have an interactive, uh, uh, communication and um, uh, an outreach program that is to disseminate to the policymakers in terms of our research output. We have managed to build capacity in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, to the point where most of the institutions that you see have been strengthened just because of that capacity. I'm one of those products, and there are so many other people, so many others that we can talk about. But anyway, it's good to talk about it because this is also going to be an area of collaboration in terms of research. And uh, the people seated in front here are not likely to see the slides, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, let me talk about, let me go into this uh, electronic payments ecosystem because that's where I want to start. But my first point, my first point when I entered the central bank in 2007, my, I was faced with this issue about what happens, what, 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 what are we going to do with the, uh, the request to uh, actually license mobile phone financial services payments. But most people didn't understand it that way. It was called M-Pesa. But I want to show you M-Pesa is just one pro it's a product, but the idea stretches far much wider. But the other aspect I was faced with was how do we ignite financial inclusion? And I remember calling CEOs of banks who are also my friends, what do we need to do? And one of the topical issues that came up is how do we bring branch networks to the people we tried even trying to say brick and mortar is expensive, but we can actually minimize how much we can do. The second thing was uh, agency banking. I sent a group of uh, a team of people to Brazil and Colombia, and they came within two weeks. They came up with draft regulations about agency banking. But when M-Pesa hit the ground, it was a coordinating mechanism for all those. But that is the most important point. But my point, my first point here is that. Yesterday, I listened to Women Banking and the presentation and talked about even dormancy of, of accounts. Even today, we suffer from dormancy of accounts. We thought that financial inclusion was opening accounts in the banking system. But I think that the new direction that M-Pesa gave us is that you need a transactions account. Savings comes later when you have surplus. You can include everyone once you have a, an, an efficient a uh, retail electronic payment system. And that's the starting point. That's what M-Pesa is all about. The second thing is that we have talked, uh, since yesterday, I've listened to a very nice debate, and I, th I thought that uh, you need to recognize in countries like Africa, where we have market segmentation, you need a product that can navigate across market segments. And it's going to be very difficult. Banks are not going to those market segments because market segmentation is defined either distance to the market or even levels of income and maybe a combination of so many other factors. But anyway, that is maybe that's why when I talk about electronic payment system, I will 
course, come up with why we call it a retail electronic payment system. We want, I want to show that it is actually the entry point in terms of financial services. And then after that, we can talk about financial inclusion. And then what happens to the ecosystem after that? So essentially, even though I have some slides here, I don't intend to go through them one by one, but the most important thing is, is uh, just to point out some few things that uh, I like and I've liked. I, I've seen the World Bank came up with a new methodology of trying to analyze payments instruments. And we were so happy about the, even the survey that has been done. And I've looked also at surveys that have been done outside the World Bank, like the, in Canada, for example, how much cost cost, uh, how much uh, cash will cost in terms of distribution and all that. But I'm, I'm happy to share with you one of the recent um, examples that have been done, is, especially in Albania, is that once you migrate, or let's say, when, when you are using physical instruments, the consumers manage or well, pay almost 50% of the cost of that of the transactions but when you move to electronic payments actually that 50% shifts to the uh, uh, infrastructure providers so it's an idea that actually electronic payments system themselves are becoming cheaper to the consumers the whole issue is if you have the fiscal infrastructure then you can talk about scalability but then uh, Retail electronic payments, and this is where I come in, is um, one, it's in 2003, the Central Bank of Kenya was given a, an extra mandate, that is to ensure, to have a, to, to make sure that you have a safe, efficient payment system that will support a successful financial uh, inclusion goal. And then all of a sudden we started looking at how do we effect or how do we bring up a, a, payments, a, 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 a payment system, a national payment system, which was not part of the core market at the very beginning. And so it means that you start with the legal framework. And the legal framework, by the time it started in 2003, by the time I went to the central bank in 2007, it has not even been approved by a parliament. And parliament is one of those institutions that it's going to be very difficult to push. But we wanted a, a payment system or a transactions platform that was going to be important in terms of the entry point. And it's also going to be real time. And also, of course, the emerging evidence has shown that if you actually have a successful financial inclusion, then of course, when you talk about financial inclusion, which is actually market accessibility, it makes a, a difference. I'll talk about uh, the mobile phone based later. But the most important thing is that we have seen the successes, maybe I can proclaim that the success we have seen is that financial inclusion has been effective because of having a very well, uh, maybe well, should I say, uh, uh, accepted retail electronic payment system. And beyond that, it has actually generated its own life because essentially it has come up with products that are accessible. I've seen studies that have shown that women can actually enter that space and save in products that cannot be encroached. And that for us is very, very important. And uh, we have also shown that when women take up that, they are efficient savers. The, 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 the cycles between savings and investment are reduced. And I think there's a study by somebody, Tavanit Suri in MIT and uh, Jack Suri in Washington. They have come up with a paper to show that. Actually, 2% of the, of the households in, Afri in Kenya Af have been lifted from poverty. So essentially, financial inclusion becomes a public policy that actually can help us in terms of uh, sustainable poverty reduction. But let me talk about the Kenyan case because I just want to be very brief here. There are four stages in Kenyan, in Kenyan case. And then M-Pesa, you know, Sophie, Sophie talked about uh, that there, there was a need for the corporate, the Safaricom is an is MNO, to actually increase, uh, their, 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 it's a need to serve the market in the right way. But actually, Safaricom just took it on the, uh, uh, from, uh, from the air. Actually, the whole issue was Safaricom had a nice system of prepaid uh, airtime. And all of a sudden, everybody started trading with the airtime. Then one microfinance realized that if my customers don't have to come to the city, they can use the airtime to pay for their loans, then they don't have to come and we can do that. But then there was one catch. We have to approach Safaricom 
to create aggregators so that several people can send their airtime and somebody can aggregate and send it to the microfinance. That's how they went to Microsave to do the analysis. I think this has been documented by Bill and Mary Guest Foundation, like um, um, uh, some people who have done some good work. I was trying to document this uh, case study in, in Oxford, and that is where the starting point comes in. And Safaricom realizes, oh, this could be a good case. Let's try to research, and that's how DFID comes in to provide, uh, uh, to provide some in, in intervention. That is where I started, but now, we talked about legal framework. It's only, it only became changed into M-Pesa in 2006 when the government changed the law or made it the law to recognize electronic units of, current, of money and electronic units of uh, electronic signatures. That is what changed the style. Otherwise, it could have been a butter trade. Ch send your airtime. We know the equivalent amount, and then we can transform it into amount. Anyway, that is a story that we, is for another day, but that is the starting point. The Saf Safaricom actually realized that it could take advantage, and that is good advantage because so far we have uh, seen how it has been successful. Let me su summarize what four stages in this. The first stage was just transfer, P2P, government or even farms to P, payments for goods and services. But for me, the most important, thing, uh, important point about, about this stage is that there was a retail electronic payments platform, which was efficient and it was safe. I've seen colleagues in the world, uh, some friends in the World Bank and even um, Oxford University, uh, Lawrence Klein and the current mayor, they came to the conclusion that actually in Kenya, liquidity distribution is taking place outside the banking sector, outside the banking hall. And that was a very important contribution because it was actually because of the agent model, the master agent model. Again, there's a lot of information behind that. You can talk about agent in, uh, master agent information model and how they resolve the liquidity uh, problem. So in a sense, the novelty of this stage is the transactions account became actually, sorry, the, the trust account beca became the transactions account. It was the retail electronic uh, uh, payments platform that became very, very important. And the telecoms were just the transmission background, uh, backbone. I've gone to several African countries and they come and tell me that we want a bank red model, not a telco led model. And I always tell them that the telcos were just the transmission back backbone. What is the role of the telcos? They change cash into electronic units of cash and store it in the trust account, which is in the commercial bank. So they just, that is their main function. And they are regulated with the guidance that the central bank provides, plus the communication authority. The rest is left for the central bank to actually manage the payment system. The second stage is virtual savings account. And I remember Bill Gates himself really pushed us, talking about, oh, you have been very successful with M-Pesa. Yes, but it is not even affecting the intermediation in the banking sector. It is not, it is not going to affect people's lives because essentially people's lives are going to be affected by one, savings, two, credit, because they can enlarge their asset base and escape cycles of poverty. And then the next thing is that it's expensive. Unit cost was very expensive. How do you actually turn it into a savings platform? And it worked. I remember promising Bill that uh, it will work. Just give us, a, give us some time and it's going to work. Thank you. Uh, no time. So the virtual savings account was really a magic. But the next thing was use transactions data and the, and the savings data to generate credit scores for use for short-term credit. I think this is the, the, the part I liked most. And today, and uh, I've been telling uh, people that we have seen that the virtual savings account and the virtual credit uh, supply platform has moved to five countries. It moved from Kenya to Tanzania because Commercial Bank of Africa was there. It moved to Uganda. It moved to, uh, to Ghana, uh, so, sorry, to Rwanda. And now it has moved to Cote d'Ivoire. You can imagine. I have been looking at that, even micro data. For example, in Rwanda, when it was formed, there were 9,000 run applications every day, and they were approved, and the turnaround time was not more than 45 seconds. And the average loan was about $5, and the payments period was 21 days, and then NPLs were very low. And the fourth one is the cross-border. This is the interesting bet because we, we allowed Western Union can only send money to the banking platforms, and then after that, you have to actually get, 
travel to Nairobi or any other station to get your money. Now you can get it in the in the in the in the in, in, in your mobile phone. Anyway, having said that, I want just to talk about five outcomes. First, I've already talked about the first one, retail electronic platform, retail electronic uh, payment system, which is effective, efficient, transparent, and safe. This is very important. The second one is financial inclusion, and even financial development has taken place. And we can talk about poverty reduction. We can talk about even something that I'll talk about later, about even the effectiveness of uh, monetary policy. I went to the central bank and actually when I looked at, uh, I looked at the, the, the accounts, the banking accounts, and even who was borrowing and who was lending, there was just like uh, 3.4 million accounts for a population of about um, 30 million. Then I asked myself, why do we complain about the banking sector and the reading rates because nobody is going to the banks. Anyway, that's for another day, but we'll talk about it. But even I went to the central bank when AML CFT regime in Kenya was so bad, and we tried to improve on it using this. And then because of time, sustainable business models, I'm very happy about this. We can talk about this. FinTechs, this is where FinTechs comes in. They can roll out products, even payments platform for other, sect or for other sectors of the economy. We have already made a contribution about tax policy and even fiscal policy design, public finance with the IMF in the, there is a volume in 2017. We talked about even, I even provided the Kenyan case study in terms of how even the fiscal, the, the, the Kenya Revenue Authority was designing tax payments platforms on the basis of these retail electronic platforms. And finally, even the government was designing e-government services based on that. Because I have to finish, let me talk about my, my last paper has focused on four areas. And this is something that we can talk about <coughs> replicability across the, from the experiences in, in, in Kenya and East Africa. We can even talk about Af, uh, the rest of Africa. I've talked about this in so many, uh, uh, so many um, areas, but let me focus on four areas. One of them is connectivity. And since yesterday, I've heard about this. Inclusiveness allows us also for uh, connectivity. You know, the government provided the physical infrastructure, that's fiber opt optic across, uh, ac across, the, uh, across urban centers. But the core infrastructure is the one that moved the payment system to where it is. The second one is interoperability. This is a market conduct thing. And of course, the Kenyan case stands out, but it's a whole issue of saying, how do we ensure interoperability? We, interoperability will increase the ma market size and also lower unit cost. But other issues must come in, but we have to look <laughs> at that. The, then, of course, transformative regulatory technology, that is something that I've always said. There's somebody who mentioned that if you cannot allow innovation in the market, then obviously the market cannot move. <laughs> electronic ID system in Kenya, we succeeded because of ID, but to secure the market, we need to move to electronic payment system. And the final one, and very important for me, is state and, uh, and uh, institutional capacity <laughs> to regulate. There are risks that are emerging. And I'll give you a story because I don't want to talk about it more than abuse my authority more than this. <laughs> By the time I was leaving the central bank, I told the government, and I even talked to the president, telling him that we have to regulate the betting, online betting, because it can come to hurt the financial system. We have to tell the regulator. I had already written several letters to the regulator for the betting. But they didn't listen. Of course, they went, the betting companies went to parliament and marshaled the MPs so that the law was not passed. And then in the end, what happens? So now, as, as we stand now, there are more than 3 million Kenyans that are blacklisted because of betting online and borrowing through, 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 uh, through, through the credit, through the, the virtual credit. The problem is that if you just open up and say these banks must actually pro provide full provisioning, it would be a major credit risk. But for me, those are the points that we would like to replicate the, uh, across the, the African economies. These are the points we would like to make sure that we safeguard. But this is, go this is what is going to help in terms of this digital evolution. Thank you very much. Sorry for abusing. You know, and I, but of course, you don't know. I, I traveled very far. I would be, it would be very bad if I only traveled this far to come and talk for 10 minutes. But I don't want to argue about that. Thank you so much. Governor Ingrid, please. Well, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, when I got the, the, the request to, to, to participate, I was 
participate here uh, I couldn't this is because the title is the future of settlement banking and my uh, institution has been around since 1668 and we would like to be around for another 350 years so it was just irresistible and uh, back then 350 years ago people were carrying around 22 pound copper metals, coins 22 pound copper coins no way 22 kilos, it's about 50 pounds. <laughs> and that's very impractical, so they invented <laughs> so the paper money. <laughs> and now the issue is what happens when paper money goes away. So that's what we're going to do here. The other one is, as was mentioned, I'm also the chairman of the Toronto Center for Leadership Training of Supervisors, and Papa Q is the CEO is sitting over there. We deal a lot with financial inclusion, which is also one of this conference. And so far, the Toronto Center in the years has trained around 12,000 supervisors uh, all over the world. And finally, not least, I'm back. I was here back in 1971. <laughs> because then I went to high school in Saginaw, Michigan. And that's where my accent comes from. It's a, it's a sort of combination of Saginaw and the Swedish cook in the Muppet <laughs> <laughs> but but to the to the topic, I, I of course talk about these things from a central bankers uh, perspective. And uh, central banks they produce a public good or many different public goods. The goods we provide monetary stability, we provide financial stability, we provide settlement, and this is important in safe central bank money. And we issue notes uh, and codes. In many parts of the world, these things are these things sort of work properly. Not everywhere, all the time. But there are some issues that all of us uh, struggle with. And at the global level, one issue that comes back again and again and again, and that's the topic of this panel, is cross-border payments. And another one is sort of the combination of financial inclusion and cross-border payments and how to, uh, how to uh, deal with that. And then you combine that with arguments and discussions about new technologies available and how potentially to use those new te technologies in this, uh, in this uh, context. Uh, two things come to my mind uh, when, it, when it comes to this, that where we really need to get better on the public sector side. One is set up settlement system for uh, cross-border uh, payments. And here uh, in the central banking community, at least my view is that we have not been ambitious enough. And that's because central banks have a national mandate. Central banks never have a cross-border mandate on anything. Uh, because all of us, all of us carry our, our own history in our backpacks. And that has been an impediment actually to doing these things in, in, in a better way than what we used to do. The other one, which is completely outside what central banks do, uh, but it's incredibly important, it has been briefly mentioned earlier today, and that is that in order to do everything digital, you actually need to have need to have a secure online identification of individuals and companies. You actually need a national digital ID. Because if you can't explain to others who you are in a digital form, forget about know your customer, money laundering and and all the rest. Now, if my view is that central banks have not done enough, then what one would expect happen in this field is that as happens everywhere, if each other realize, hey, there is a vacuum there, and we can make some money out of filling this vacuum with something, uh, well, then exactly that's what, uh, that's what happens, and then that's where you get Libra and Ripple and Bitcoin and utility settlement coin and all the rest of it, you name it. And that's not at all surprising because then you say, okay, let's see if we can sort of capitalize on this, given that we have mastered uh, these uh, uh, technologies. Uh, but then what does that mean uh, when it comes to the future of central banking? Well, first of all, we need to accept that within this field we have failed, and that's why Libra and others showed up out of the blue. And that really has put a fire under central bankers uh, scratching our heads. Now, what, not what's next and what, what, what to do? Now, having said that, one also needs to be mindful of the fact that central bankers are probably not the fastest animals in the financial ecosystem. <laughs> uh, but when they move, they can move with force. And that's because central banks produce a, a public goods. And public
published goods are usually not, if history gives us any guidance, provided in a good way uh, by the private sector. So what the private sector does tends to either create monopolies or these systems crash sooner or later in one in one form or the other. And the reason for that is very, very simple and very basic. In everything dealing with money requires legal support. Because money is not technology. Money is what we have with our heads up here. That that is how we define money. And the public sector has the monopoly power to produce new laws. So you need the support of parliament to make that happen in one way or the other. So essentially, the issue we're talking about is how to combine legal frameworks with the technology available, and then discuss what is a public good and what is not a public good. Now, on the issue of real-time uh, settlement systems, let me just mention one, one example and what I think is doable in the, in the future. Quite recently, the ECB has set up its TIPS uh, real-time small value settlement system. So yeah, you can send money within 10 seconds all over Europe, not used very much. It's a multi-currency system. We're presently discussing with the ECB, and within a year, year and a half or so, I hope that we can use this system for settlement from one cell phone to another in Swedish Kroner. Now, if you can, if it takes 10 seconds to settle a transaction or five or something, it's fast. In Swedish Kroner, and then you can do the same thing in Euros, you probably don't have to be Oystra's brother to realize that it must be possible then to move between Kroner and Euros back and forth, also within 10 seconds. So I'm just looking for somebody on the private sector side who would be willing to, uh, to do that. And if no one shows up on the private sector side, several, the central banks themselves certainly can, uh, can do it. But having done that, well then, that of course also means that you have to be able to define who you are. And you have to adhere to the money, anti-money laundering legislation and all the, all the rest of it. And that means that you have to have online identification systems in one form or the other. And that's why I think uh, the Indian example is so incredibly important when it comes to thinking about uh, thinking about this, because it's not the financial sector only when it comes to doing, doing this. The other one which was also the question is that if you start doing this uh, cross border, you need to harmonize. Because take, for example, a transaction from one cell phone to another in Sweden, you can't do the same thing from one cell phone in Sweden to one in Germany, or vice versa, or one in Denmark. Then you actually have to agree on the standards and uh, how, to, uh, how to do that. Technically, it's a piece of cake. But then you have to get a bunch of people around the table, and they have to agree on something. And particularly in my, in, in my uh, corner of the world, if you are wealthy enough, you really don't have to agree to do anything, at least for a while, until you get poor enough so that you realize that somebody else is running faster than you run, you run yourself. So you have to have interoperability in one, in one form uh, or, uh, or the other. And, think, and why is this something that is uh, important to us? Let me give you some numbers, some examples. Uh, cash is on its way out. Cash, uh, as a share, the share of cash at the point of sale presently is down to 13% of transactions. 40% of the people never use cash at all. And if you talk to retailers, restaurants, and hotels, many of them sort of say that we're probably out of cash completely by 2025. Not because they, not because somebody has decided that that's the way it's going to go. It's just that it's so much more convenient to use uh, use technology. And particularly when I'm talking various international fora, people come up to me and sort of hint that I'm the guy who has decided that we're getting out of cash. <laughs> who has decided this? And I say, no one has decided. It's the convenience factor that actually produces this uh, over time. And here, on the central banking side, we have to think hard about why is, it, why is this happening? Is it because we central bankers use old-fashioned technology, paper money? Or is there something else in this that we need to uh, deal with when it comes to providing two things? One is payment systems, real-time payment systems, and the other one is uh, moving out of cash into uh, electronic claim, retail claims on the central bank in, in one form or the other, central bank digital, uh, digital currency. One issue that we struggled with, and it was also mentioned in the earlier, earlier panel, 
which is quite important, is that moving away from cash also means that earlier you talked about financial inclusion, but these new systems also actually de facto produce financial exclusion because it just becomes too hard to use these systems for people with various types of disabilities. And so far, what I have seen on the private sector side, on the private sector's willingness to actually produce systems that everybody can use, is just not there. Because there's not enough money in producing apps and other, other uh, tools available for people with disabilities. Because if you have a choice at the national level, of producing something that a few hundred thousand people can use, or if you have millions or billions, uh, then it's easy to, to figure out what, uh, what people uh, will, uh, will do. Now, uh, so th those are some of the issues that are important. There is one more very critical issue, I think, when it comes to moving into digital money in one form or the other, and that is who defines what money is. Most people take this for granted, so they have never ever thought about it. Because they do, yeah, but I know what money is. But talk to the lawyers, and when they scratch on the surface, they, die, they just can't come up with an answer that makes sense. So we have sent a petition to Parliament saying that the last time you did dealt with this, the first time I think you dealt with this in Parliament was 1809. <laughs> and then you sort of came back in 1904. And now, Physical cash is disappearing, and physical cash is legal tender. That's essentially how you define the unit of account, the Swedish krona. And if physical cash disappears, then what is a Swedish krona? Nobody really knows. So we have written to Parliament and said that, like it or not, this is what you do in Parliaments. Once every hundred years, you have to think about this. <laughs> and now, since you happen to be here, it's your time to think about this and, and, and what to do. And what we really, really will need in the future is a legally clear definition of legal tender in an electronic world. Because if we don't have that definition, we don't know what we have. Now, why is it that I'm talking about, uh, about this from this perspective? That's because I'm a central banker, and it's my job to produce a good called the Swedish Krona. And it's my job to ensure that it's good stuff that we produce. Because most people never think about money this way, but money is comparable to apples. If you produce good apples, people buy them. If you produce bad apples, they go somewhere else. And it's my job to make sure that we in my country don't dollarize or start using the euro or any other currency. That would be a complete failure or failure on my side. So part of my job is to make sure that we get the plumbing right uh, so that uh, people continue for another 350 years uh, to use the stuff that we produce. Thank you. <laughs> So earlier today, many people have brought up the, the why of financial inclusion, and I think uh, Mr. Vanda here will help us think about some of the things that, that the governor and the former governor said and, and help us extrapolate to why some of this stuff is important in some of the private sector applications that come from this. Thank you, Adrian. Can everybody hear me? Is this better? Low? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about financial inclusion uh, within the broader context of infrastructure. Uh, one, the global infrastructure deficit, and also the uh, current um, cultural and economic prioritization of sustainable infrastructure development. Um, I'd like to say, a big thank you uh, to the Gates Foundation, the University of Michigan, for having me here today. It's truly an honor on behalf of the rest of the team of Bonnie and Infrastructure to be considered worthy of uh, speaking after two central bank governors. Um, this is not my first time at Michigan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the last time I was here was 2006, and uh, we're not going to recall the score of that game. <laughs> I left a uh, very sad man that day. Um, but that same year, 
uh, there were some interesting developments in the world um, led by Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General at the time, who passed away uh, two years ago. Um, I was in Ghana uh, last year for his uh, funeral, and it was a very sad day. You know, for me, growing up in Ghana, when he was announced as UN Secretary General in 1997, it was a very, very big deal for the country. And as a nine-year-old at the time, it really opened my eyes to a whole new world of possibilities when you start to think about you know, what your future options might be. And it's never been lost on me that you know, I was one of the few people in Ghana, few kids in Ghana at the time that had access to electricity and cable network news. So I had the, the opportunity to have access to that information that helped you know, shape my worldview in such a profound manner. Uh, and when you think about that within the broader concept, broader context of you know, 800 million people being without electricity in Africa today, uh, despite $120 trillion of capital, institutional capital in the world that's seeking uh, long dated yielding asset-backed investments, it tells you that something is broken. And at Banyan Infrastructure, we're on a mission to harness the power of technology to enable the financial community to help bridge that gap in, in funding the uh, infrastructure gap. Simultaneously, um, I'm sure many of you saw this last week, um, a group representing 30% of global banking signed on to a new charter uh, where they're committing to prioritizing environmental and social governance as part of all their new lending practices. This is a, a watershed moment um, for the issue of climate change because in order to truly try to address climate change, we need to think about retooling the current infrastructure that we have. And when you consider that, and the already existing deficit in infrastructure spending is a real issue that needs to be considered at the highest levels of government and the highest levels of finance because it's going to require a lot of financial resources to bridge that gap. So, at Banyan Infrastructure, and Adrian, thanks for the introduction, and what we've done is this really, we spent a lot of time studying what some of the challenges were. And the governor Ingus just said, you know, money and value really is about law. It's about contracts, it's about agreements, it's about the exchange of property rights. And so we've taken the view of trying to understand the legal structures around project finance. But we've noticed infrastructure projects have become smaller over time. We're no longer building billion dollar coal plants anymore. It's going to be an amalgamation of 20 to 50 million dollar smaller solar and wind projects. And the cost to lenders to manage a bunch of bespoke and heterogeneous loan agreements to bridge this gap, particularly in light of regulation coming out of the global financial crisis, Dodd Frank requiring ongoing due diligence on every single loan, this is becoming a hindrance. Uh, to lenders. And so we've taken the view of harnessing the power of distributed ledger to bridge that gap. So what we do is we convert loan agreements into smart contracts. And then we connect those loan agreements to the sensors of the underlying assets that are funded. And as all agreements are an amalgamation of clauses that are data dependent, we're able to use the real-time sensor data to automate all the uh, contractual agreements and clauses, all contractual clauses within the agreements. We built a dashboard that gives lenders real-time covenant tracking and reporting on how each individual loan is performed. Uh, this has been very well received with lenders. We're working with uh, reference lenders in the U.S. and Europe. We're currently approaching half a billion dollars in loans uh, on the platform, and we started going to market in March. So it's been. It's been a, a strategy that seems to be well received, but there's a bigger story here, right? Um, we're still a very small startup, and you know, why should anyone care about all this? 
integrating what we're doing with all the new initiatives that we've discussed over the last couple of days starts to now shape, reshape the financial system to make it more nimble in order to allow it to address uh, societal challenges. So in the issue of digital payments, you know, as we're able to connect digital payment systems to our network, we now allow you know, a lender to have a much more effective lean on cash flows. You know, in structuring these deals, lenders are using the law to try to find innovative ways to perfect the liens. But by digitizing the contracts, automating reporting, we now add another layer, another tool, which lenders can use to try to perfect that lien. So as um, a woman in Kenya pays for you know, water or electricity with a pizza, once that's digitized and it's connected to the smart contract, an asset manager you know, in New York or Stockholm can now rely on code to perfect the lien on that cash flow to that asset, which then makes lenders much more comfortable bundling up and securitizing these smaller loans, which opens up a lot of liquidity and allows the funds to flow in order to bridge this massive infrastructure gap. And so the other thing that we started doing since we started integrating a bunch of data points is tracking ESG as it's become very important to lenders. And so you know we have real-time information from the sensors on renewable energy assets. We can calculate in real time and codify all the environmental metrics that anyone will care about. And what's important is this information now becomes a part of the loan itself. It's not a separate sustainability report that may or may not be produced annually. It, it now becomes part of the living data room of the financial agreement. And every single transaction in the event series in this loan's history, this credit, you know, this credit agreement's history, in the, in the full loan life cycle from origination to securitization, is captured and stored on a distributed ledger and in a shared view between borrower and lender. So this mutability on what is transpiring. Um, we're getting ready to come to market next year for our first green bond uh, to help one of our lenders refinance one of their portfolios. It would be the first green bond where you know, each lender would have a token, a key, uh, onto our distributed ledger where they can track the priority of payments and all the environmental metrics in real time. And I think this is very important as central bankers around the world uh, continue to now think about uh, requiring more transparent reporting uh, for ESG metrics. This is something that the task force for uh, financial climate financial disclosures is pushing for, uh, and we're also seeing in Europe that uh, central bankers are starting to include green bonds as part of their asset purchase agreements. So I think you know that combination of reducing friction by ad, you know advocating for for lenders to provide more you know more regular autonomous reporting and you know, creating fuel to the system by actually purchasing the green bonds. I mean, the laws of physics tells us, you know, you want to really become an agent of accelerating change. You, that's the way to do it. Produce friction and add energy. So, pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to our discussion. So I want to pick up on a, a couple of themes from, from earlier today, and in particular um, that our central bankers here mentioned. One of the things that came up earlier was the decisions that central bankers, uh, regulators face in terms of their how to engage with innovative technologies, whether it's regulating quickly, regulating out of existence, taking a hands-off approach. Uh, and I wonder if uh, Dr. Ndungu and, and Governor Ingves, if you could think about and, and talk, speak to the times at which you've been dealing with the disruptors 
um, M-Pesa maybe about a decade ago and, and now digital currency and how you thought about the decision, I think in the case of Kenya, to take a watchful eye but sort of a hands-off approach as it's developed um, in the private sector and then in the case of of Sweden, how, as you said, you weren't the decision maker, um, so you've taken the, the watchful eye of some of the private sector apps and other things developed, but you're also piloting the e-Krona. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you came to the, the calibration of how to engage with these disruptions. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I think uh, I, I joined the Central Bank at a time when uh, there was a wave of pyramid schemes. So it means that uh, even the PESA itself was classified as a pyramid scheme. And you can imagine that it was going to be very, very difficult even to get it out and argue in a different way. But I think uh, after listening to presentation by, by the, some of the, the, the key people from the, the media, the, 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 the telecoms and even the Ministry of Information and their communication, I came to the conclusion that actually this is uh, uh, something that can help the market. And I coined the term that central bank should be an agent of market development. The bottom line is that how do you take care of risks? I think in the presentation, what we really asked is providers and even potential market, uh, uh, we're calling them disruptors. They are disruptors. We wanted actually to make sure that our, our law because of the uh, public nature, the public which I could provide, is actually to make sure that we mitigate any form of risks. And so we have paraded all forms of risks that uh, we thought we should, we, we should take care of until we came to the conclusion that everything was covered. So any licensing was very much dependent on have we taken care of any emerging risks or any form of vulnerability that may hit the market. Once we were satisfied, then we actually went. Uh, I think that is the approach that I took. Uh, I mean, one very basic starting point was that for us was just looking at the graphs, realizing that people won't use money anymore. <laughs> <laughs> physical and well, that's sort of scary when you run a central bank because then you say, well, you know, maybe we're getting out, running out, but maybe we're, somebody else is taking over our business. We don't know what, what do we do. So that's one starting point. But there is another very important starting point also, and most people never ever think about that because most people never never deal with the funding of money. They just take it for granted. And that is the fact that banks don't trust each other. So banks have a very strong preference for clearing in risk-free central bank money. And that means that the payment system run by the central bank is the core of the whole thing. And that means that everybody is interested in talking to you about how you actually do these things. Because you cannot move money from one bank to another without having the money passing the payment system of the central bank. Because in that environment, let's assume away the central bank. That takes you in this country back to 1905 or something like that. And those who read up on history know that that did not work well at all. So everything ends up in the central bank sooner, uh, sooner or later. And take, uh, take our switch system, which is transactions from one cell phone to another. Now we have, in a country with a little bit more than 10 million, we have more than 6 million users. We were part of that evolutionary process from day one. Because what the general public need not understand at all is that when you do a switch transaction from one cell phone to another, ultimately the money actually passes out payments. Because the banks don't trust each other. So we have been part of that and we have supported that from, that from uh, day one. But at the same time, of course, one would like to see that this evolves in a safe and in a sound way so that people don't uh, get uh, get uh, cheated, and that's why you need to keep an eye on it. And try, you need to try to move fast enough so that the whole thing does not move to other other places. And I mean, this holds all over the world because if we are talking PayPal, if we are talking Apple Pay, or whatever all these systems are called, ultimately the money passes through the payment system run by the central bank. So those are only like what you showed about M-Pesa, kind of 
what, what the end users see and know, but you can <coughs> never get around the central vacuum control. So that's why you are kind of part of this process, and ideally you should try to do it and in a nimble way compared to just complaining and trying to turn back time. <laughs> And just to follow up, Governor Ingrid, I wonder if you could provide us all, especially the audience here and the audience online, as you're watching your pilot develop, are there any early conclusions you can share or new questions that are, that are popping up that you did not anticipate? Uh, we have lots and lots of tech people come and talk to us. And it's striking that they don't know a thing about money. <laughs> they know the tech part and they know how you make money but that's different from moving money and so that's one striking feature of this, this conversation another very striking feature of it is that same thing actually holds when you talk to people who are experts in monetary policy because that's something completely separated from monetary theory and very, very few people have an education in monetary theory. And sort of the inner workings of money and some of those issues are almost philosophical. And this is, and that's, this is really the hard part to, to create teams of experts with different backgrounds and get them to talk to each other in such a way that you actually create something that, uh, that works. And that's kind of where, uh, where we are. We are presently going through a tender process. And uh, we have a number of tech companies bidding for the people of pilot. And once that process is over, we will produce uh, an e of pilot. But it will be, produced, will be done in such a way that it is scalable. So that to the extent that ultimately parliament decides that if this is fine to do, uh, we, can, uh, we can do it so that at the national level. And exactly, we had exactly the same conversation more than 100 years ago. Because more than 100 years ago, the banks issued their own physical banknotes, and the central bank issued its physical money. 100 years ago, the bankers argued that there was no need for central bank physical money, and now they argue that there is no need for digital central bank money. So in that respect, there is nothing new under the sun we can <laughs> try to construct, these, uh, construct these things. And time will, uh, time will tell where it will go. But I must, it's pretty hard, actually, to deal with these issues because so much of this is equivalent to dealing with electricity. You just assume that in this part of the world, you're, you have 110 volts coming out of the socket, and you never think about how, how it happens. And the same thing with money. You just take it for granted and assume that there is a certain structure uh, that is being used to do these things, and then you all of a sudden realize that hmm, maybe that's not that's not the case. It's actually real people who decide on these structures, and you can change these structures over time. But people find it incredibly hard to get their heads around that. And I have we have plenty of conversations with the general public, and they talk about. A, an equal in terms of what it would look like. <laughs> and that, that sort of catches it, how hard it is. Well, Governor, you touched on collaboration and how so the, the tech people come in and they don't know anything about central banking um, or financial regulation. Um, I think you know the same is often true. Sometimes you talk to regulators and it's hard for them to keep up with all the developments in the private market. Abdel, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe just thinking about your experience broadly beyond just Banyan, but, but also um, back to your history in, in investment banking. But now you've sort of seen this opportunity taking your cues from some of what's happening in the financial inclusion space, in the ESG space, and use that to find your business opportunity. So there is a a collaboration of sorts there, and I wonder if you could just speak to that and tell us how you how you look to central banks and other authorities to decide how to form your technology for a business opportunity. I think um, collaboration is, is going to be key. Um, you know, in my, in my comments earlier, rushing at the end, but I was trying to 
allude to you know, the friction that exists you know, in, in the market being a real barrier. And, and that friction is really there because you know, lenders are concerned about regulation. And if, if there was no if there was no regulation and no central bank uh, that they had to answer to, banks would just be doing whatever they wanted to do. And we've seen we've seen that story uh, before. Uh, and you know, while regulation is good, I think that we need to think about how we embrace the power of technology to reduce the burden of the regulation on the financial community. And, and that's where I, I would hope the central banks will continue or you know, actually accelerate their efforts to engage with tech companies to really understand the, the power uh, of the technology. You know, um, at Banyan, we've been fortunate to get this far because we, we had a few lenders who were willing to really engage with us very early and, and allow us to experiment um, with what we were thinking in a broad way. And I think on the regulatory side, more of that engagement will make the lenders feel comfortable. So coming back to this idea of different, different jurisdictions being at, at different places, I wonder, uh, Dr. Ndungu and, and Governor Ingves, if you could tell us maybe a little bit about the, the conversations you've had or experienced in terms of, with your counterparts across the world um, and how others are, are thinking about central bank digital currency where some are, are really leaning in and experimenting with, with going cashless, maybe being led there by their constituency, um, while others have, have sort of stuck to the need for cash and really resisted the idea of, of central bank digital currency. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think when it comes to uh, jurisdiction, you have to start. Is that on? Or yeah. Okay. You have to start from the home front. And I, I, you know, I didn't push on because one of the things I had big fight with the banks, with, with, with commercial banks, especially in Kenya, that is the time also there was a success in terms of microfinance. Some banks have had succeeded in terms of microfinance. They argued that the small, this, uh, the MPSA is going to actually snatch their customers. But I argued that uh, you need to encourage this because essentially then you can get deposits and even you can earn ledger fees 24-7. Because essentially you can get everyone actually participating in the payment system throughout the night. And uh, I think I remember I was in the U.S. Treasury and uh, give, uh, making a presentation, and and the, the U.S. Uh, the, the Secretary of the Treasury argue, said that actually you can pay for uh, a, 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 a taxi in Nairobi using a mobile phone at midnight. So it means you are drawing from your bank. Now that that is the Kenyan case was the banks were very much opposed to this, but in the end they realized that oh, all of a sudden they actually don't need to even create large number of branches. They can use the agency network. They can use virtual accounts. So it's a question of investment. Let me go back uh, when, uh, we, when we started even talking about it. I remember I had so many occasions that I had to talk to the IMF and the World Bank, actually even to explain how it was working. And that was a, a very difficult aspect because at one time it was being seen like, oh, it's a, a payment system with, with no regulations. There were, we, didn't have, we didn't have a legal framework for payment system in Kenya then, because it was still sitting in the parliament waiting. And what we did was to, to, to invoke the trust law, and then the, the trust account, which later became the transactions platform, was actually a cash-in, cash-out uh, uh, technological platform, which, again, was actually um, guided by the, the trust law, and the trustees were the owners of the account. This worried even other jurisdiction. Now, of course, in the end, after three presentations, that is every annual meeting, I think the World Bank and, and the IMF agreed that, that it was working very well. What about the African regions? And actually, most of the governors in the region, except for Tanzania, everybody else thought that we are allowing telcos to deal with money. And I think this, this, this is an idea even 
I've gone to uh, Nigeria like several times, invited by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to talk to the central bank and even the business community and the banks. And then they believe that we don't want a telco led model. Kenyan model is a telco led model. And then I actually insisted that it wasn't. The moment, the, the whole idea of converting cash into electronic units of the same cash has never sunk very well across even most African countries, even to date. There are some countries that they say, oh, it is working very well, but I'm not so sure it is good. So essentially, that, that, it is the same thing about the, the, digital, uh, the digital currency. And um, I made a, a, a point about that earlier. So essentially, it is across jurisdiction, we still have these doubts about how can you convert cash into electronic units of cash and still call it cash. Again, it goes back to what uh, uh, Governor Ingves is actually talking about. I, I, maybe it is a space we really need maybe to come back and try to redefine that. But I think when uh, most observers came to Kenya, and that's why in, um, in AFI, Alliance for Financial Inclusion, the digital working group, it has changed names. By the time it started as a mobile phone financial services working group, now it is the digital working group. And because I was chairman that time, I think I had to host most of the people, most of the people from Asia, Latin America, and even Africa to come to the Central Bank of Kenya and try to understand what is really happening. It is the whole concept across the jurisdiction that how do you have electronic units of money in your phone, and then it is also in the in a in a in an account uh, in the same way. Now, of course, that comes back to the uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, and. Um, I remember there was a big item in the news last year. A woman in Kenya was actually saying that she pays her bills in a hotel using the Bitcoin. And it was a good analysis and uh, they missed only one point. How do you make the payments? But the whole idea, and the journalist went on even hunting for the governor, luckily I wasn't there. And then, <laughs> then they were asked, then they were asked, did you ask how the payments are made? And essentially, it's the, if you have a wallet, if you have a wallet, Bitcoin wallet, then you can change units with the same wallet, isn't it? And then we say, if you really want to make Kenya shillings out of that or dollars out of that, you still have to go to a POS, to a point of service. And that's when they said, don't ask Central Bank to talk about or even to accept a currency that doesn't know the origin, doesn't have rules of the game, doesn't have a legal framework that you can rely on. And th that is how we were escaping this debate. So across jurisdiction, everybody was like, no, the central bank should allow uh, cryptocurrency. And then the question was, where is it coming from? Who is? And I think this is the, the kind of uh, uh, issue that Stefan is raising, that maybe it is the failure of central bank to allow some innovation, but central bank has to go through the ground rules that are supposed to be required because at the end of the day, if you lose your income, there's no mercy for the central banker because they come back and say the central bank did not advise. That's why I started by saying, once you have the risk mitigation and we paraded a lot of risk mitigation, and then we paraded the legal framework that is required, and then we paraded the guidelines that are supposed to be followed, then you'll be sure that the, it will work nicely along those sides. In fact, I've been uh, looking at different literature and I've realized that the description of M-Pesa is one of the most successful uh, uh, regulatory sandbox. But when we were doing that in Kenya, we didn't realize that's what we were doing, but actually <laughs> that is the case, that is the outcome that is showing up. And, uh, this is about a number of different uh, things. First. The first issue is the payment system, wholesale and retail. And ideally, it should be nowadays, or a few, a few years down the road, 24 7, both wholesale and retail. And if it's uh, real time growth settlement, then you don't need to post collateral because you don't close the system at night, and that reduces the need for collateral in the system, in, in, in the system as a whole. And eventually, it also does in the banking community, community think through this and come to the same conclusion that it's probably better to do everything real time because then you don't have to post collateral because of the time. So that, that's a good thing. The other part of it is uh, a central bank digital currency, and that in some sense is a bit of a different issue because here we already, and we have had for years and years, 
wholesale central bank digital currency because banks deposit money with the central bank. So there the underlying issue is to what extent uh, a retail central bank digital currency is a complement to what you already have. And here it differs enormously from country to country depending on what kind of a monetary system you have. Uh, to what extent does the, the, the country in question is underbanked or overbanked, whether you trust private institutions or whether you don't trust private institutions at all. So that's that's an issue there. And then finally, uh, cash as a backup is not going to go away because if the lights go off, you can't do the thing. And then that means that it's my responsibility and it's nobody else's business to understand how I do it to make sure that we can distribute cash all over the country if need be, if there is a problem. And the private sector will never ever do that sort of voluntarily. So that needs to be there. Now, to your point about the conversations you have had about where, where is my money? Because that's essentially, I mean, we are constructed up in our heads to think about things in a very tangible, and that's how we think about notes, coins, gold. And then all of a sudden everything becomes digital. And then, then people ask themselves, where is my money and what does it look like? But your answer is not to say it's, it's in the cloud. <laughs> you say, in whose cloud? And where do I find the cloud? And that's where it gets really, really difficult to deal with these issues. And that's where you get into the whole issue of trust. And who is actually backing up this system? Is it the government or is it somebody else? And this, of course, varies enormously from jurisdiction uh, to jurisdiction. And in the worst cases, you are better off if we take Zimbabwe or Venezuela to actually use somebody else's cloud or somebody else's money, and where you have trust to do it domestically. But in addition to that, it doesn't really matter if, if you are talking about cell phones, computers, iPads, cards, whatnot. That's kind of really is irrele irrelevant. The key is actually to make sure that you can use many different technical ways of storing your money and making your payments. That is really, uh, really the key to it. But when you do that, then you also get into the issue that was alluded to this morning, the cost of doing this thing. And let me give you one example. I'm not good at the numbers, but I think that's sort of, there are sort of ballpark numbers, but they're not completely off. Uh, my personal view is that parts of Europe is seriously overbanked, and that has to change that has been seriously resisted for decades. Now, in those parts of Europe where you're overbanked, you tend to have a cost to income ratio around 80 to 90 percent. Nordic banks tend to have a cost to income ratio of around 45 to 55. If you set up an, a, a, a new bank today with a banking license, you would just basically just an internet bank, maybe you'd get to a cost of income ratio of about 20, 25%. And then we heard earlier this morning about the marginal cost of one more transaction if you use modern systems. Now, that is going to be disrupted. There is no question about that. And either you go with the flow, and you are capable and willing and able to scrap your own mainframes, or you just fight it and fight it like crazy, hoping that you will survive. And that's an underlying issue. And let me go one real example from my world. We started talking to, to our banks, I'm talking about the major banks in the country, about a year ago, and we said, guys, we're heading into an environment and a world where payment systems can be run technically 24-7. So what about extending our opening hours? And I had in mind really extending our opening hours. Our, our payment system, our wholesale system, opens at 7 and it closes at 5. A few of them came back and said there is no need to extend their opening hours. And then this month, we will actually extend the opening hours from 5 to 60. <laughs> no, that's not the future. That's not the future. Eventually, somebody else is going to show up. If, if, if that's the pace at which we change things and say, hey, we can run this 24-7. But those are sort of some of the issues that one has to be part of, part of bottom. 
because we have all in our backpacks a certain structure of the financial sector, and that structure will have to change. And still, when that change takes place, we need to maintain trust in the system because otherwise, the whole system. Will I think we've got about 15 minutes left, so I'd love to open it up to audience Q&A. Yeah, yeah. And please make sure you introduce yourself. Wait for the mic and then introduce yourself as you're asking your question. I think. Yeah, I think David has a. Hi, my name is uh, David Eric, and I'm a co-founder of a fintech called Petal, and also a co-founder of a nonprofit with Joanne Barefoot uh, called the uh, AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation. Uh, I want to thank uh, Adrian and Michael for pulling this together. This has been just a phenomenally thought-provoking and interesting conference. I also want to thank our three distinguished guests, because this has really been a very, very interesting session. Uh, I have a question. Uh, actually, it's for Governor Ingves. Um, with regards to the transition to an e-currency, uh, one of the primary um, values of cash is privacy, privacy of transactions. Uh, and as we all know, uh, and perhaps foreshadowing our next session, it's also one of the great pitfalls of, uh, of, of cash is the access to money laundering and the heinous crimes that that can enable. Uh, as you start thinking about transitioning to an e-currency, how important is the question of privacy? Is that a question that is a part of what a central bank should be concerned about? And if so, what frameworks have you been thinking about? And what data will you see? This, this differs enormously from country to country, and depending on whether your public sector works or not, and what kind of history you have. But the key to this is really, if you start thinking about it, so maybe I'm thinking about the in terms of the pilot that we're doing now. If you, if you create something digital which is fairly cash like, then it's a must to apply the same AML rules that we use for cash. And the world has changed enormously on that side because you cannot anymore buy things with a suitcase full of cash. I mean, that just would not work. So in that sense, the world has uh, the world has really changed. And the real underlying issue is what preference you have. Is it better to have the government knowing about what you're doing or some private company knowing about what you're doing? And what, in both cases, what are the, uh, what are the safeguards uh, when it comes to the business? So, our bottom line is basically to say that the rules have to be the same. It doesn't really matter whether it's digital or whether it's uh, physical. And the world has really, really changed when it comes to how we deal with uh, money laundering issues compared to the way things were dealt with in the past. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Dominguez at the University of Michigan. So. Um, the central banks, all the central banks I know of, have a national mandate, which I think uh, you mentioned as well. And uh, they're not global. Uh, they're uh, really focused on what is best for the domestic economy. Uh, but all that we've been talking about is this kind of um, idea of trust and potentially cross-settlement uh, of payments. And I'm just curious, uh, since we're talking about the central bank of the future, uh, how would we actually move from this kind of very nationally focused uh, uh, set of institutions, um, or, or would the central bank of the future in your uh, minds actually be an international central bank? Or are we gonna stick with the current kind of country by country model and have coordination across them? I'm just curious about where you think that's going. There is no support for a global central bank presently. No <laughs> zero political support for that. So the only- years though. No, 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 the only, <laughs> the only way to do it is to have central banks uh, cooperating in, in one way or the other. Because, I mean, this issue sort of is constantly 
kind of under the surface, and we have the IMF, and we have the SDR, and technically you could sort of let that evolve over time, <coughs> but in the near future, it just ain't going to happen. I think uh, uh, different, uh, different, di different jurisdictions can answer that question differently because uh, I think from where I come from, especially the African region, central banks are really good agents of market development. And once the market has developed, then they move on to their core market. Because essentially, there is always, um, the core markets are always well defined. One of them is monetary policy, financial stability, and of course, support government, now we have national payments, and then support government's uh, national development agenda. The next, the question is, what is government's national development agenda? One of them is actually supporting the market. But once you've done that, then you move on to the next, but perhaps you let the market flow. And that, 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 is, that is going to be, maybe the, the central bank of the future is actually to look at how do you nudge the market to the right direction, and then when do you reef? exit that market? When do you exit that the market has actually, should I say, um, produced the right uh, environment and is actually evolving on its own, on its own? That is, you are out for the endogenous development. And that is from the region that I come from, if the central bank doesn't provide that kind of shepherding and, and nudging the market in the right direction, then obviously it will be failing in terms of the national uh, development agenda. But it doesn't have to be there after the market has evolved. Maybe that's the way I would look at it. And uh, of course, everybody talks about regional integration, and we, we meet, I think. The best we have done in the East African region is to adopt the same kind of monetary policy framework. And um, I'll talk about it. So one of them was the encouragement from Stefan those years, uh, when everybody was moving into inflation targeting. But beyond that, how they use different instruments depends very much on the market development, on their own market development, and how the central bank have pushed the market development in, in that kind of sphere. Can I, yeah. can I add to that, though, that one thing that is happening also in a world where you have many, many central banks, and this holds particularly for, for smaller countries, is a, is a world where it becomes less and less likely that you develop your own systems because it's just cost too much to do that. And when we're talking about digitalization, when we're talking about, let me, let me give you an example. When I was a young man in the options business and, and I dealt with stock exchanges and things like that, everything was made, put together domestically in one form or the other. Today, you can buy a stock exchange off shelf. In the future, it's highly likely that you can also buy a digital currency off shelf because it's not that hard actually to, to produce these, these things. And in that environment, it's one thing to be responsible for things, but it's a different thing in terms of where actually the servers are located and how you operate, operate the systems. And take our present payment system, which is getting the, the wholesale system. It was actually, from the beginning, developed in South Africa. It's owned by an Italian company. And I think that the good, good, a good chunk of the rewriting of the code is probably done in India, or I don't know where it's done. But it's actually, that's how these things evolve nowadays. And that's globalization, because it's unrealistic for us to hire 200 IT people and do all this on our own. Uh, because it's much more efficient to have somebody else uh, doing it. But it takes quite a while to get to that point because once people say, well, you know, are you buying this from somebody else? Um, they, they, they get kind of a bit suspicious. And this is really where it pays to, uh, to cooperate. Hi, uh, Matt Corley, a former commercial banker and now an MBA student at the University of Michigan. Uh, it's, it's clear that the pushback uh, on Facebook's Libra is that we need a much closer partnership between the public and private sector. Uh, it, I'd be curious to get all of your opinions on kind of what is the best way to collaborate towards, you know, a global currency of the future. <laughs> if, I, if I knew that, I probably wouldn't be here. So a, a second best is to ensure that we have transaction systems that are efficient. 
and that can handle these things because most likely we will still continue to have national currencies, but we maybe we will have fewer national currencies in the future than what we have had in the uh, in the past. And how that will evolve, I just uh, I just don't know because there has been so many attempts and so many political conversations of the, uh, uh, over the years, let's say in the context of the IMF. Uh, to think about a global currency, but as long as nation states produce laws, uh, then that's just the way things will stay. Good afternoon, Chris Kalabi from the Gates Foundation. In the 20th century, central banks, regulators, and organizations like the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision wrote standards and rules. These are words written down that tell people how we expect banks and other types of institutions to behave and what they should and shouldn't do. But today and yesterday, we've been talking about artificial intelligence, and we've been talking about automation and 24 by 7 availability and intelligent agents, and Abdel is writing code to help monitor smart contracts and so on and, and loan agreements. So might the Central Bank of the Future or the Basel Committee of the Future stop writing rules and instead write code or maybe mandate the use of certain technologies. And Abdel, would you be happy in a world like that? <laughs> so for our two governors, maybe first on, on, on what might change about rule writing in the future. I would be happy in a world like that. I think it would make for a much better world. Um, but you know, in my opinion, I think you, you typically see that innovation that seldom comes from within. Um, you know, there's a reason why Kodak didn't invent Instagram. Um, usually you need a fresh perspective. And so I'm of the view that, you know, collaborating with third parties uh, to properly, you know, innovate is probably the best path forward. But, you know, the end game um, ends up being the same. Uh, more of a, a digital regulatory environment, I think, uh, would, would allow the whole system to function more efficiently. Uh, I think that you just have to keep at it for years and years and years. And there was a story the other way, the other day in the newspapers about uh, some kind of a postal agreement and an organization which is more than 100 years old dealing with uh, how much you pay when you send, send packages cross-border. And then this is just how these things uh, evolve over time. And I mean, here, when it comes to code or no code, I mean, I, I mentioned the whole issue of a, a digital definition of who you are. For that to be meaningful cross-border, you have to agree on what, what the nature of that kind of a definition would be. And that would require some serious conversations about how you actually uh, do that. Same thing when it comes to the SWIFT system, which is basically a global system dealing with not making payments, but dealing with payment messages. And you need a global standard to, to do that, to deal with that, because otherwise you would have no idea what kind of messages go with the payments. And that's one example where it has been possible to get to an agreement on how this is, uh, uh, this is done. But it is never, it's never easy. Uh, because, I mean, being chairman of the Basel Committee, you sit there, the chairperson, and then you have 50 people around the table, and all of them say that they are right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to try to make sense of, sense of that and just live with the fact that there are many rights, using the plural. <laughs> Maybe we do one more. Uh, yeah, Michael Wiegand from the Gates Foundation. So, you've, you've, several of you have said the you know the existing cross-border payment system is is outdated, uh, doesn't work well. Um, we don't think we're going to move to a global central bank and a global single currency. Um, you know, the TIP system is owned and run by by a single entity. If you think about other regional efforts, and I know that that uh, Governor Ndugu and former Governor Ndulu in, in Tanzania were starting to think about uh, East Africa uh, regionalization. 
does this require a, ultimately, do we need a, a global entity that runs a global payment system? Can this be done just through cooperation? Um, and it, you know, you talk about SWIFT sort of plays some of that role currently, but like Abdel says, innovation you know, rarely comes from within a, a monopolistic company. Uh, where, where it's, what's the way forward? How do we think about this? And is, do we need new entities that can help drive a whole new um, cross-border payment system? I, don't, I think it would be just too difficult because each and every time we start thinking about something global, creating a better world, nothing moves because it's just too hard, because it's sort of say, let's create a Cadillac or a Rolls Royce. It never gets done. And all those who have been involved in major IT projects know that. So if you aim for a Fiat 127 on a sort of a regional basis, uh, that's one way uh, to start. And, Maybe this is not a very good comparison, but it, it has something to do with your question. The first cross-border mobile phone system ever constructed was the NMT, the Nordic mobile phone standard, sort of G1. And the rest is history. Because it was possible to agree on a standard between a limited group of countries. And then others sort of realized maybe there is something in this. So if you can sort of gradually prove your case, you can take it from there. And that's certainly the case in, in various parts of Africa. And if you agree on it without talking forever, you just get on with it and do it, then it will happen. And uh, eventually it will be copied by others or others can sort of voluntarily join. Because each and every time you try to create something where you impose things on others, it just won't happen. Or at least that's my, my view. Yeah, I, I, and, and I think uh, what Michael is you're mentioning is that we, we tried to do that in East Africa. We created the East African payment system. And then the first step was actually to, to link up the RTGSs, those countries that didn't have very adequate real-time growth settlement. We, they managed to get funds from the African Development Bank and the World Bank, and they were able to mount that. The next thing was actually when it came now to cross-border payments, which required that you, you can actually use the local currencies. So what hit us very badly was actually the, first of all, is the, the national payment system in each country. We were not very well aligned. But the, the most inhibiting was actually the bilateral, bilateral exchange rates. And, and in a sense, nobody wants one currency to dominate. And I argued that we can develop a new area, but nobody, would, nobody thought about it. So we decided Kenya and Tanzania can go about it, and then we'll be posting the bilateral exchange rate. We find we fund account corporates who are funding uh, their accounts in the currencies in the currencies that were. it meant bringing in physical currency. Of course, we realized that it can't go for 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 long. With physical currency, you take uh, your physical currency, Kenyan Kenyan shilling to Tanzania in Arusha, which was nearest, and then you you bring some to Nairobi. Obviously, nobody was taking this, the Tanzanian shillings. So essentially, it wouldn't go further. So we went further and said, if we have a national, a new area for the East African economies, then it can work and we can push it to that level. But again, it all depends who is the first, who is, who is the leader, who is the leader in this. I think after uh, Kikwete and Kibaki left the scene, everything died slowly. Nobody even talks about it. It is a national leadership problem because once the readers agree, central banks will be very, very effective in moving to the next level. I want to thank our panelists for a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs>